everyone, the Mad Naturalist, Mr. Langers here. Welcome to the first episode of this series looking into environmental science. We're going to span everything from ecology into human interactions with the environment, population dynamics, and pollution. And finally end the year off on how the world is changing and what we can do with them to improve it. But we're going to start the show off looking at ecosystems and how they are put together and how they form. Now you've heard of an ecosystem before, but to do this the right way, we're going to look at the way an ecologist does. An ecologist is someone who looks at interactions in an ecosystem. Now in biology, you're probably used to the idea of starting with a cell, then working your way up into a tissue, then an organ, then an organ system, then finally the organism itself. In ecology, we do things a little different. We have to look at things from the big picture and zoom in down. So the first thing we look at is this idea of a biosphere. Now the biosphere is anywhere on planet Earth that can support life or has life living there. And that's almost everywhere on planet Earth's surface. The surface, mind you. Not We're not talking about journey to the center of the Earth with tiny elephants and dinosaurs and things like that and giant bugs. We're talking about real world right here and Earth's surface. If we look in a little further, what we see is this thing called a biome. Now that's not made necessarily a term that you've heard before, but all you need to know is that a biome is a region of Earth's surface that has certain similar climate conditions. We'll look closer at what a biome is later. The next thing we have is the ecosystem itself, which if you've been paying attention in science class forever, you'll know that the ecosystem is the is meant by, or made up of interactions between abiotic and biotic or living and non-living things. We zoom in a little further and now we have a community, which are the interactions of all the different organisms in a specific area and how they interact with each other. No abiotic factors, just biotic. Then we have a population, which are all the members of the same species living in a region. And then finally, the individual itself. Now for the ecosystem and the community and the population, those are very scale dependent. An ecosystem could be the underside of a rock in your garden, or it could be the entire northern hemisphere of the, of the world. It depends. Scale is very important, and the scale at which you're looking at something will dictate the different factors that go into it. But what's at the heart of this is this idea of species interactions. How organisms interact with each other, how organisms interact with the non-living things around them, how they interact with members of their own species and members of different species. So that's what we're going to look at right now, this idea of species interaction. Okay. So, species interactions. We already know we have biotic and abiotic factors in an ecosystem, but you can also have interactions between those as well. And there's several main types of species interactions, right? Six of them, really. You have interspecific competition. You have intraspecific competition. Those two sometimes get lumped together, but we're going to treat those as two separate things because they change a lot. Then you have predation, parasitism, mutualism, and then finally commensalism. Now, all of those things are at the heart of species interactions going on in ecosystem, and understanding those are key to figuring out how an ecosystem is doing, its state, how is it recovering from a disturbance, uh, and how it will fare going forward. It gives us a predictive tool. So let's take a closer look. All right, competition. One of the more interesting ones, for me, inter it's competition and predation are the two more interesting species interactions, right? Most common type of interaction between members of the same species or different species. That's what competition is. You guys do it between each other. Uh, if, you've ever, if you have a pet and you've ever competed with your pet for something you just put on a plate, you'll understand what, that, what we're talking about here, right? These are a negative, negative interaction. You always have to give up something to win, right? And usually you've harmed in some way. So these tend to be negative, negative interactions where one person or one organism loses, the other one who happens to win has to give up something in return. So no one quite gets out all the way on top. Inter-specific competition is competition between different species. So in this picture, you're looking at grizzly bear who have killed some furry woodland creature, probably a elk, uh, and or one of them has, 
And then you have wolves that are looking to sneak in and grab some of the eat. That's interspecific competition. It could also be that the wolf made this kill and a bunch of grizzly bears found it and pushed the wolves off the carcass. So that's interspecific competition. Then you have intraspecific competition. Uh, these two are very interesting creatures. If you don't know anything about uh, marine mammals, these are, I believe, southern elephant seals, the largest seal species on the planet Earth. Uh, these two are vying for what's called the Beachmaster title. Beachmaster is control of a section of beach, and if you have a large section of beach, you have control of all the females on that beach, which means you get reproductive rights, or in theory, exclusive reproduction rights. What you have to understand that nature does not care who wins and who loses. Nature is just the referee. And there's a very simple way to win this game. There's actually one way. You reproduce and your offspring reproduce. If you get those two things, you have won the game. Nature doesn't care how you do it. Nature doesn't care that you do it. It just makes sure that you follow the rules. So these guys are vying for as big a beachfront property as possible. And that means they can reproduce the most. Not always the case, though. There's a different strategy at play. We'll look at that later on. The problem with competition, like I said, it's negative, negative, and no one wants to be hurt in any way, shape, or form, even if you win. So, so species have mitigated this, right? They've mitigated competition so that the interaction, they interact as least possible and they don't use the same resources because you're competing over things like food, space, water, mates. That's all what things com organisms compete over. So you want to mitigate that. You want to lessen the impact of that. And one way to do that is to, you know, partition out the resources you have. Resource partitioning, which is different species that you know, compete for simi similar limited resources, evolve traits that kind of allow them to share the resource. They don't compete as much anymore. It could be using the resource at different times or using it in different ways. So if we're looking at this right now, we have a couple different species interacting in this picture. We have something like uh, sardines, a schooling fish. We have dolphins and we have northern gannets, which is a diving bird. Now they're all well, I shouldn't say all, the gannets and the dolphins are competing for the same resource, the sardines. But resource partitioning has kind of split it up. The gannets are a diving bird, but they can only dive to a certain depth, all right? So the dolphins don't have to worry about competing with the gannets under a certain depth, so they will usually, you know, they can attack the fish from multiple angles, from multiple depths. It's only when they come close to the surface that the gannets get involved. So this is an idea of resource partitioning. This also gets the idea of an ecological niche, or niche. I use both words interchangeably, forgive me. But it's a role that an organism plays in an ecosystem. It's like its job. It's where it lives, what it eats, who eats it, what services it provides. These are all things that go into what a niche is. So as you mitigate for competition and you partition the resource up, you start developing niches for specific species to live in. Right. Here's another of resource partitioning. These are all different bird species. They all live in coniferous trees and they all eat insects and similar resources. But if you look, each species has evolved to live in a different region of the tree. Whereas this one is exclusively in the crown of the tree. Uh, these two are this one, these two are more towards the middle range, and this one's more towards the core of the tree. And this one down here is more towards the bottom of the tree, the understory. It's all using the same resource, but they've partitioned it off so they don't directly compete with each other as much anymore, which is beneficial for everyone. Predation, my favorite. It's when a member of one species chows down another species and it's dead. This is an example of one of my favorite uh, predators, a robber fly. It's called a drone fly right here. These guys will catch insects on the wing and they pierce their, their exoskeleton with a proboscis, stun them, paralyze them, and then liquefy their insides and suck them out. Gross, but really cool. Uh, these guys can be pretty small or as big as your thumb, depending on what species you're looking at. But this is an example of predation. It's definitely a positive-negative interaction. 
Herbivory is similar, where you have an herbivore eating a plant. The difference is, is that an herbivore doesn't have to kill the plant to consume it. Predators do, right? You don't see cows walking around with a couple legs missing and chunks taken out of them. It doesn't work that way. So predation is, both of them are negative, negative. Predation, you have to kill. One kills the other. Herbivory, it does not have to happen that way. The predator-prey relationship, though, developed some really interesting evolutionary um, intersections, very ev interesting evolutionary developments, right? It has very significant impacts on population size as well, which we're going to look at when we look at population dynamics. Here we give you an example of what I mean by predator-prey dynamics creating evolutionary, interesting evolutionary outcomes. Take a second and find me the tree frog. Need some help? Let me uh, zoom in a little bit. It's in that region. Okay. If you haven't found it yet, or if you have, great. But there it is, chilling right there on the log. Okay. Again, if I take these away, Evolution has dictated that this strategy of camouflage is what's best able to hide this frog from its predators. And that's what this predator-prey interaction, predation has driven this species to blend in. And this blending in will drive the predator species to try and beat this countermeasure. It's how it works. Now, we're moving on to the last thing, looking at the symbiotic three as I talk about them. These are symbiotic relationships, which means that you have two species interacting in balance, and usually one species or both cannot live without the other. And what we're looking at here is mutualism. It's a positive-positive, where both species benefit from the interaction. We're looking at parasitism, where it's a positive-negative, again, where one species benefits and the other one is harmed, either fatally or not. And then finally, you have commensalism, where it's a positive neutral relationship, where one species benefits, the other one's just like, eh, I don't care, all right? But those are all symbiotic relationships. So let's take a look at a couple of them. Mutualistic relationship, we have Aphis mellifera, the honeybee, or European honeybee, pollinating a flower. The bee gets nectar and pollen to consume and energize itself and its colony and its brood and the flower gets pollinated, which is how it reproduces. So it's a mutualistic relationship. They both benefit. Parasitism, let me introduce you to the most deadly creature on the planet Earth, the mosquito. Parasitism, you have the mosquito gets a blood meal, and it's only the female that gets the blood meal, mind you, it's not the male. Female gets a blood meal to help it reproduce. You lose some blood and you have an itchy whelp and you may contract some parasitic infection from it, another parasitic infection, like malaria. So that's why it's a positive negative. And finally, commensalism. I cannot think of a better species to encapsulate this idea of commensalism than the Cape water buffalo and the oxpecker, right? The oxpecker bird has a free ride, you know, on the back of the of the water buffalo. Nothing's really gonna mess with them. We're on the back of a giant cow. They get bugs, they eat the parasites and flies flying around it. Uh, and the buffalo really doesn't get anything. At first, most people assume that it gets ticks taken off and things like that, but science has found that there's very little impact and sometimes even negative, where the oxpeckers will make scrapes and drink their blood. It's kind of grody. But it's a very least, a positive, neutral, commensalistic relationship. All right, so let's recap. Earth's biosphere can be organized based on specific characteristics. Right? We look at climate, we look at weather, we look at species, and we can organize the biosphere into that. That's the biome level. Spe ecosystems will run off of species interactions. How they interact with each other and what they interact over drives everything in an ecosystem. The most common interactions are competition, and it's competition for a shared resource, whether it be water, food, space, light, mates, whatever it may be, it's a shared resource. And that's at the heart of most competition-related interactions. 
predator-prey interactions can lead to many interesting evolutionary traits and population dynamics. And finally, symbiosis is a relationship between two, at least two species and it, to the point that at least one of those two species cannot live without the other. So thank you for joining me for this first installment of hopefully many. I will see you around later. This is Mr. Langers signing off. Peace. Thank you.